Hey, what's going on guys? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at Hard Kernel's all new x86 mini computer. I really can't call it a single board computer because we do have to add RAM and storage, but this is known as the Odroid H2 Plus. And you might actually recognize the design and the name because in 2019 they released the Odroid H2 and that was powered by the Intel J4105 but unfortunately they couldn't get enough of those chips to keep creating it so they moved up to the H2 Plus and they've added the Intel J4115. Now the CPU in this isn't a super jump over the 4105 but it should add a little bit of extra performance but one of the biggest updates that they did to this new board, the H2 Plus, is the inclusion of dual 2.5 gigabit ethernet. On the original, we only had dual gigabit ethernet, so this is a pretty big upgrade for people who wanna create a mini server with something like this. Now, before we jump into testing, I did wanna talk about the price of the Odroid H2 Plus. Now, the base model comes in at $119, and that doesn't include a power supply, RAM, or storage. So you'll need a power supply, 15 volts, 4 amps, it's $10 from Hard Kernel's website. You'll also need some RAM. This supports DDR4, SODIMM, up to 2400 MHz, and what I did was just pick up some used RAM on eBay for $32. It was 8 gigs, two 4 gig sticks, 2400 MHz. And as for storage, this does have two SATA ports, so you can use a 2.5 inch SSD or hard drive, or even a 3.5 inch if you want to. But if you want to go M.2, it only supports NVMe. And I just opted to use a 256 gigabyte Western Digital Black NVMe drive. And in total, the way I have this configured with the board, power supply, RAM, and storage, I'm up to $187. You could go with some cheaper RAM or a cheaper NVMe and bring the price down a little bit, but this is how I have mine configured. 256 gigabytes of storage and 8 gigs of DDR4 2400 megahertz RAM. Now this really can't be classified as a single board computer, but when we think about these tiny computers, we always throw the Raspberry Pi into the mix, so I wanted to show you the size comparison between the Raspberry Pi 4 and the H2 Plus. So as specs go for these smaller maker boards, it's pretty decent. We have a J4115 Intel CPU. This is a quad core CPU. It has a single threaded burst up to 2.5 gigahertz and a multi-threaded burst up to 2.3. Built-in Intel UHD 600 graphics up to 700 megahertz. It supports dual channel SODIMM memory up to 2400 megahertz, and you could go to 32 gigabytes if you really want to. One M.2 slot for NVMe storage, and this runs at PCIe X4 speeds. Dual 2.5 gigabit ethernet ports, two SATA 3.0 ports, HDMI 2.0 and DisplayPort 1.2. They'll both do 4K 60 hertz out. Two USB 3.0 ports, two USB 2.0 ports, a 3.5 millimeter audio jack, plus we have an optical audio out, and a 24 pin expansion port, also known as GPIO pins. And you may have noticed I didn't mention anything about Wi Fi and Bluetooth, and that's because it's not included with this board. And since this is running an Intel x86 CPU, we can install a ton of different operating systems on here from Windows, Android x86, there's a lot of retro operating systems that we can install also. Tons of Linux distros, but for this video, I'm going to go with Ubuntu 20.04. So installation went over easy enough. It's just like installing to a laptop or a desktop. After all, we have an x86 CPU in this thing. I just wanted to give you a quick look here. We're on Ubuntu 20.04 LTS. We have that Celeron J4115, and we're sitting at 1920 by 1080, and I have the UHD 600 graphics. I'm fully updated here. I got all the latest drivers that we can use. And now I think it's time to get into some testing. I mean, overall, the user interface here, even though we're using GNOME with 20.04, is pretty snappy on a board like this. Haven't had any hangups or anything like that. Updates are easy enough. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, you do have to install the deb package for the Ethernet driver here. But after it's installed, you're good to go. It will detect both Ethernet ports. So the very first thing I wanted to do was just run a quick Geekbench 5. I have also tested Geekbench 5 with Windows 10 running from a 2.5 inch SSD. This is the score with Linux, single core, 460, multi, 1573. And if we take a look at the same test run with Windows, single core 418, multi-core 1444. Now they're really not that far off from each other, but I've run it three times on each and each time with Ubuntu running on the H2 Plus, we did get a better single core and a better multi-core score here. Now this doesn't mean that Windows runs horrible on this board because I have been doing some testing and I will have a video coming up using Windows with the H2 Plus, but I just kind of wanted to give you a look here at that benchmark. 
Next on the list is some video playback from YouTube. We're going to stick with 1080p and we'll go full screen with it because that definitely stresses out the CPU and GPU. Looking pretty good here. We had two drop frames on the initial buffer, but it's running really smooth here. 1080p, 60 FPS. Let's take this up to 4K and see if it can handle it. I'm going to let this buffer out for a little bit. And as you can see, even though we're buffered out up to 20 seconds here, it's still dropping frames all day long at 4K 60 full screen. So we'll come down here and just see what happens when we're in window mode. And it's not much better here, as you can see. So streaming 4K 60 from YouTube is pretty much a no-go on this, as it sits right now with at least the Chromium web browser in Linux. But what about streaming from Plex? So here we have a 4K 30fps video, H.264, 17 megabits per second. Not bad, I do notice a little stutter here and there. So let's take it up a little bit. And this video is 4K 30 FPS H.264 87 megabits per second. This gives all of my other ARM based single board computers a run for its money. Usually it crashes. Oh, and I thought it had it, but nope, we still got that stutter there. And that's not buffer stutter. I was actually really hoping it would handle this here, and in my experience so far, I've had better 4K playback in Windows. Now, this is definitely not a computer you want to buy for 4K video editing, but I wanted to test it out anyway with OpenShot, an open source video editor for Linux, Mac, and Windows. It actually works really well. I've got three clips here. They're not that long, and I think it's a total of about 1 minute and 15 seconds. I added four simple transitions here, and this is just a single track. I exported it as MP4 H.264, 4K 25 FPS, and the quality set to high. It took me 22 minutes to get this 1 minute and 15 second video here. Exported. But, um, I mean, it turned out fine. We have a 4K video that was exported on this machine at 25 FPS. Doing the same video at 1080p only took it 9 minutes. So it is possible to edit video on something like this. I mean, it's definitely not ideal, but it can be done if you're patient. Next thing I wanted to test out was some Steam games. So here we have Half-Life 2, and this is going to run the old Source Engine games really well. I do have the FPS listed up in the top left-hand corner, and I have enabled V-Sync. We're at low settings here. But overall, we're getting a pretty steady 60. It does drop down every once in a while into the lower 50s, but it's playable on this machine. Next up, a 2D side-scroller, Dead Cells, an amazing game. If you've never tried it, definitely download it. It's running in OpenGL. Every once in a while, I do notice a little bit of frame dip, but it seems pretty playable here. And I know a lot of my viewers want to know about emulation on this machine, so I've installed RetroPie. And we're going to test out PSP and GameCube. I will have a full emulation video coming up. First things first, though, we're going to go with PSP and Tekken 6. This is the standalone version of PVSSPP. 3x resolution, no frame skip, no speed hacks. We're getting a constant 60 here. PSP is performing really well on this little board. But now it's time to move up to something a little more higher end. GameCube using the Dolphin emulator inside of RetroPie on this little board. We're going to be testing out Soul Calibur 2. Not the most demanding game, but like I mentioned, I will have a full video coming up. I'm actually pretty impressed here. I'm using the Vulcan back end. The FPS is up in the top right hand corner, and I haven't seen this one go under 54 FPS. So as you can see, there will be GameCube games that are going to be playable on the H2+, but don't expect the full library of GameCube and Wii to be playable. I know there's going to be some games that will struggle on this machine. So 
So overall, running Ubuntu on the Odroid H2 Plus has been a pretty enjoyable experience. Everything's been pretty snappy here. I was able to play some older Steam games. Emulation seems like it's a winner on this little board, and I will have more of that coming up, but I definitely want to test Windows on this thing. Now, I could definitely use this as my daily desktop. It is much more powerful than the Raspberry Pi 4, but it's a lot more expensive because we have to add our own RAM, storage, and if you want Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, you'll have to get dongles for that also. But still, I think it's a cool little maker board, and it's a great addition to the x86 lineup that's been coming out in the last couple years. But it's definitely not a game changer for maker boards. We're still working with a low-end chip here, even though it's x86, and it is more powerful than most of the other ARM boards that I've ever tested on my channel. I've run into better x86 boards, and the first one that comes to mind in the same price range here is the ReComputer, or the Odyssey. It comes with 64GB of internal storage and 8 gigs of RAM. It's non-user upgradable, but it's around $180 to $190, so that's exactly what I have into this one right here. And performance will be on par with the H2+. But before we wrap this up, I wanted to talk about total power consumption of the H2+. Now, I don't have any external drives plugged in or anything like that. I have a kilowatt meter plugged into the wall. At idle, it pulls 4.8 watts. 1080p video streaming from YouTube, 7.6 watts. And in my extreme stress test, which maxes out the CPU and the GPU at the same time, 23.6 watts. So it's definitely a low power draw board. I mean, not as good as, let's say, the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus or even the Raspberry Pi 4, but we are working with more performance here. But that's pretty much it for this video. I really appreciate you watching. Definitely keep an eye on the channel for some Windows testing and some emulation testing. I definitely want to get the emulation out of the way as soon as possible because after seeing that GameCube performance, I'm actually pretty impressed and I can't wait to test more on this. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. And like always, thanks for watching.